so the poem starts in the middle of the woods. Dante is about 35 years old and he's alone and he's scared and he's lost. He looks around himself and he sees that this is mountain in the distance with this beautiful irresistible sun drenched glow behind it. As there's nothing else around he edges towards it and decides to start climbing the mountainside. However he gets a few feet up and suddenly gets attacked by three beasts. They block his path and stop him from moving any further. Disparaged, Dante decides to go back down the mountainside and find some other way to do what he wants to do. Whilst he's wandering about, he meets Virgil. Virgil is an ancient poet uh, responsible for writing a number of very, very famous poems. Virgil says to Dante that if he truly wants to see paradise, the first thing he has to do is go through hell. Dante is terrified and he's alone, so Dante's got no other options and he really wants to go to heaven. So he says to Virgil, yes, I will come to hell with you. The first thing that Virgil does is guide Dante to the gates of hell. Now the gates of hell are emblazoned with poetry and sigils, most importantly talking about woe and pain and suffering and saying that if you enter these doors, abandon hope because there's no hope here. When they enter inside, Dante sees a bunch of souls being gnawed at by insects. They're waiting on one side of a river for the boatman Charon to come and pick them up and take them into hell proper. Now, Virgil and Dante have uh, quite a lot of authority because in Virgil's mind, they are ordained by God to enter through hell and go up to heaven. So Virgil says to Charon, you know, we, we need to cross and Charon is forced to take them across the river. When they finally reach the other side of the river, they end up in Limbo. And Limbo is a beautiful gardened realm of intelligent non-sinners. It's probably one of the most interesting sections of the poem because it discusses what happens if you're a sinner but it's not your fault. And the whole punishment of Limbo is that you can see the bright lights of heaven, you can see the mountain in the distance with God's light lighting up heaven, but you can never go there. And that is your punishment, that you can never go there. But that doesn't mean that you're living in a horrible place. So Limbo is filled with, for example, people that died before Jesus resolved the original sin. So for instance, you have some philosophers down there that were born before Jesus came. You have unborn children down there that were stillborn, that didn't survive long enough to be baptized. So the point is that Limbo is more like a pseudo heaven than it is a hell. So anyway, back to our poets. The two of them stop briefly in Limbo and they meet with poets like Homer and Horace and they chat happily with them. And then they go to this big beautiful garden citadel where there's philosophers like Socrates and they in chat and they enjoy the conversation. One thing that's really interesting is that Virgil starts to speak first time about witnessing Jesus in limbo. Basically he describes that after Jesus died, Jesus would have died and the rules that would have applied to him would have been before the original sin was resolved. So Jesus would have ended up going to limbo. And while he was down in hell, he utilized the time to start saving people essentially so he started rapturing people from hell back into heaven so for example he uh he helped his dad joseph uh go to heaven he helped moses he helped abraham and a bunch of other really really kind of famous biblical figures to escape from hell so he went down there he raptured a load of guys and then when he resurrected he could die again and then go to heaven properly limbo is still technically the first circle of hell even though it's kind of this pseudo paradise after speaking to all of these really famous figures and these great philosophers, Dante and Virgil move onwards and this is when they start to enter hell properly. Okay, so before we carry on with our quest into hell, what we need to talk about first is some history to do with Dante. We need to understand what his motivations are when he created this poem and the kind of time that he lived in. To try and stay as concise as possible, there's going to be quite a little bit of simplification with this, so try and keep an open mind. Dante was born at some point in the 13th century, at a time of great strife within Italy. There were two opposing factions within the country at the time, there were the Guelphs and there were the Ghibellines. They had a very complicated relationship with one another. In basic terms, the Guelphs believed in the power of the Pope, and they believed in following the Pope's rule. The Ghibellines believed that the Holy Roman Emperor was in charge, not the Pope. There were a lot of political reasons as to why people chose one side or the other, Sometimes it was to do with family, sometimes it was to do with politics. Dante's main problem revolved around the city of Florence. Eventually the Guelphs defeated the Ghibellines within Florence and took over. At that point the Guelphs ended up branching out into two separate factions. There was the White Guelphs and there was the Black Guelphs. 
The Pope started taking over and started making political decisions which were squarely in the realm of the Emperor's authority. The White Guelphs and Dante mostly believed that the Pope and the Emperor should be on equal footing and that one should not step into the territory of the other. The Emperor should not be in charge of religion and the Pope should not be in charge of politics. After the Guelph victory, the city was jostled between white and black Guelphs a number of times. Specifically, the white Guelphs were in charge and Dante was in politics when a French prince came to visit under the guise of peace. Secretly with him came the black Guelphs, who then took over the city. The black Guelphs exiled all of the white Guelphs from the city, including Dante, under pain of death. And Dante actually never returned in his lifetime. So Dante's whole comedy is a landscape to get his political opinion across. Within the comedy, there are people that he likes, people he doesn't really like so much, people that he knows in real life, and people that he's heard of. He uses the mythology of heaven or hell, which was a powerful political tool at the time, to tell his allegorical story. The reason I'm telling you this now is that Dante is going to start meeting people in hell. How Dante interacts with those people says a lot about what his political opinion was. For this reason, it's really important to start listening to the stuff that Dante says and the stuff that Dante starts to ask. Dante and Virgil have finally just left Limbo, and they walk through the gates into the second circle. Now the first thing Dante talks about is how huge that gate is, and the implication is that a lot of souls pass this way. Dante recognises very quickly that the second circle of hell is a lot smaller than Limbo. In actuality, the structure of Dante's hell is more like a layered funnel, with each successive circle smaller than the last by a considerable margin. As the two poets continued, they noticed a crowd of people, and Virgil acknowledges that there is always a crowd in this place. In front of all of these people is a giant creature named Minos. Minos exists to judge souls on their sins, and he decides which circle the soul has to go to. What he does is he winds his tail around his body, and the amount of loops that he makes indicate which circle that soul has to go to. Dante actually refers to Minos as a great connoisseur of sin, saying that he's basically very good at his job. The reason that there's a crowd is because Minos judges souls individually. Minos looks over the crowd at Virgil and Dante, and he says to them, There are many sinners ahead. Trust no one, or risk suffering yourself. Virgil shouts back a defiant and fearful, God protects us. After this encounter, the two poets move to the second circle proper. The first thing that Dante notices is a great cry of lamentation. He says that the sound is almost like the ocean crashing against the shore. When he looks up, he sees a hurricane of people flashing around in circles in all directions. As they cry out for help, Dante compares their movements to the dancing of birds in the sky. Virgil starts to point out souls that he recognises. He points out Helen of Troy, Tristan, Cleopatra and more. All of the souls within this circle succumbed to lust and adultery within their lifetimes, and now they are damned to eternity within this hurricane. Dante gestures to Virgil that he wishes to speak to one of the souls, and edges towards a female figure in the sky. Her name is Francesca da Rimini. Francesca was the daughter of a man named Guido da Palenta, and her father was the Lord of Ravenna. Francesca lived from the 1250s to the 1280s. Around about 1275, she married a man named Giovanni Malatesta. Giovanni was a crippled man and known to many as Giovanni the Lame. This marriage was actually a truce of peace between Francesca's family and Giovanni's family because they'd been in conflict for many, many years. After she introduces herself, Dante starts to listen to Francesca's story. I coveted my husband's brother Paola. I was in a loveless marriage that I was tricked into by my father. My husband discovered us and murdered us both. He lunged at Paolo with his sword and I stepped in front of the blade to protect him. My husband murdered Paolo afterwards. I have no doubt she will see my husband if you continue on your path. My affair with Paolo began whilst we were reading a tale of Lancelot and Guinevere. Their affair ignited our passion and for that we are damned. In the distance, Paola can be heard crying after hearing the sorry tale. The emotion of the moment is so powerful that Dante loses consciousness. Mm. 
Dante next awakens within the third circle. The third circle of hell is dedicated to the gluttons, the people that eat like pigs. Within the third circle there is a heavy, icy, endless rain. It comes with sleet, it comes with hail, it comes with misery. At the base of the third circle there is a mud pit of sludge and slime. The sinners within this circle are forced to writhe and slide around in this mud pit like pigs for all eternity. Worse still for these poor gluttons is that Cerberus, the famous Greek hellhound with three heads, is also within the third circle. Cerberus claws and bites and rips at the poor sinners as they writhe around in this sludge. Cerberus turns and notices Dante and Virgil almost immediately. He makes a break for them. Virgil's quick thinking. He picks up three pieces of sludge from the ground and throws them into each one of Cerberus' mouths. Cerberus smashes his jaws shut and goes quiet for a while. The sinners within the third circle generally ignore the two poets as they pass through. Everyone except for one man. He rises up from the mud and proclaims himself as Chaco, which is Italian for pig. Dante doesn't really care about what Chaco has to say other than that he feels sorry for the soul's predicament. To keep Dante's attention, Chaco decides to stop performing prophecies and predictions. More specifically, Chaco prophesizes the internal strife between the Guelphs after they defeat the Ghibellines. He goes on to talk about the white Guelphs' exile from Florence. By the time of this poem, those predictions had already come to pass. After this, Chaco rolls back into the mud, but not before shouting at Dante to make him famous in the real world. Not one to be upstaged by Chaco, Virgil chimes in with his own prediction. Virgil states that Chaco will not rise again until Judgment Day. Dante asks Virgil whether his punishment will be better or worse on Judgment Day, and Virgil replies, Worse. On Judgment Day, the body and soul will reunite as one, and both shall suffer together. With this, our two poets decide to leave the third circle and head towards the fourth circle, the avaricious and the prodigal. Virgil was an ancient Roman poet, and he lived around the 1st century BC. He was born and he lived in what is modern-day Italy. In the Inferno, specifically, Virgil is a soul destined to spend eternity in limbo, a realm of virtuous sinners. There's a few reasons why Dante chose Virgil to be his guide through hell. First off, Dante really revered Virgil. In the very first meeting, Dante even refers to Virgil as his teacher and his author. He constantly refers to Virgil as my master throughout the poem as well. Virgil is to Dante a kind of muse of logic and wisdom, and at the time Virgil was also quite famous in Italy. The second reason Dante chose Virgil to guide him through hell is because of his work on the Aeneid. Virgil's Aeneid mirrors Dante's Inferno quite closely. What Virgil was trying to do with his work was fairly allegorical. One of the most metaphorical sections is probably when Virgil's characters pass into the underworld. The path of his characters consists of passing by crowds of the dead on the banks of the river Acheron in the underworld. They then get ferried across that river by Charon. Soon after that they meet Cerberus. If this is starting to sound very familiar, then you can understand why. Because of Virgil's past work, Dante is utilising Virgil as an authority figure over the knowledge of Hell's inner workings. In this part, pay special attention to how Virgil treats sinners, and how commanding he is whilst doing so. Whilst heading over to the fourth circle of hell, Dante encounters the demon of wealth in his inferno, Plutus. Plutus is screaming bloody murder for Satan in a tongue almost unrecognisable from human speech. He is animal-like and beastly to look at. Plutus guards the circle of the avaricious and the prodigal. Dante becomes frightened and Virgil reassures him. He tells him that there's no power the demon has which can stop them. Virgil yells at Plutus, Make way, cursed wolf. At the mention of these words, Plutus collapses into a heap. Dante compares Plutus to the sails of a ship that have lost their wind. Passing by Plutus, the poets enter into the fourth circle proper. Inside the fourth circle is a gigantic battlefield of sinners. 
The sinners have been so badly tortured that they are almost unrecognisable to the poets. There are two sins being punished here as one. There's the avaricious, who hoard wealth with great greed, and there's the prodigal, who recklessly spend with no moderation. The two sets of sinners are forced to push huge heavy weights around the circle with their chests, forever. They smash their weights into sinners of the opposite group, and as the two sets collide, they exchange insults. Why do you squander? Why do you hold? In contrast to Dante's former thoughts and feelings over the sinners in previous circles, Dante is rather cold about the punishments these sinners have to endure. It demonstrates his callous feelings towards these sins especially. Dante notices that some of the sinners are clergymen from their shaved heads. He seeks confirmation from Virgil, which Virgil gives. This is a huge reference to Dante's opinion on the state of the church, seeing some of its members in hell for greed and reckless spending. Virgil insults both sets of sinners. He says, They are getting what they deserve, hoarding and squandering so much that now no amount of gold can save them. Dante continues his questioning and asks Virgil what fortune actually means. Virgil states, Fortune is God's manager of material wealth on earth, managing wealth evenly and fairly. After they finish speaking, the two poets head for the fifth circle, the wrathful and the sullen. Upon leaving circle four, the poets encounter black streams running down to muddy waters. These waters lead to a large black swamp of the marsh called Styx. Inside the shallower waters are the wrathful, mud wrestling to rip each other's throats out. These are the souls that gave into anger and aggression in their lives. Virgil starts to talk about another hidden group of sinners called the Sullen. The Sullen sit below the mud that Dante can see. They're the bad-tempered, the gloomy, the depressed. They're forced to recite endless hymns in the mud, those hymns only appearing as gurgled nothings on the surface. The poets start walking along the rivers leading to the Styx. They begin approaching a tower. Dante describes that the tower acts much like a lighthouse, drawing the two poets in. The tower has let off a signal to Styx's other shore. Before the tower in the water sits a small flicker of light, which Dante asks Virgil about. Virgil tells Dante to focus and the image of a boat becomes clear. Sat in the boat is a ferryman named Flagias. He reacts much like Charon, a bit off put by the two travelling poets. Eventually Virgil uses his commanding influence of heaven again, like he has done before, and both poets get on the boat. The boat pushes off from the shore and enters a channel through the sticks. Wrathful sinners still line the way through the marsh. One of them looks up to the boat and steps out ill-tempered to meet it. The next exchange Dante has is extremely important. Dante comes face to face with the soul of a black gelf and one of his rivals, Filippo Argenti. Filippo was a very wealthy political leader in Florence during Dante's time. He was notorious for his iron fist and aggression. Dante proclaims to the soul that he wishes the black gelf will be in misery and suffering for all eternity. Virgil steps in and compliments Dante with a biblical scripture. The implication is that Dante is finally beginning to learn his lesson about sin, that the sinners are not to be pitied. Virgil says to Dante, You will understand true righteousness at the end of the water. The ferryman hurls Filippo out of the boat's path, and the black gelf is set upon by a group of other wrathful sinners. They tear Filippo apart as he bites himself angrily. Virgil points into the distance and says, We are about to enter the city of Dis. Dante is in awe of how red the horizon is around the city. Noticing Dante's amazement, Virgil explains that the redness comes from an eternal hellfire within the city walls. He is indicating that whatever Dante has seen before, it is nothing compared to what's to come. The two poets disembark the boat and arrive on the shore of the city. Throughout the Inferno, and especially when going into his Paradiso work, Dante spends a lot of time talking about a woman named Beatrice. We'll start seeing Beatrice crop up fairly soon. Beatrice is Dante's visage of perfection, and he places her on the highest pedestal. Dante actually grew up with a woman named Beatrice from the age of nine, and she died quite young. He got betrothed to his actual wife, Gemma Donati, at the age of 12. Next up, Dante was a notoriously honest man, almost to his own detriment. 
He thoroughly believed that his dream of hell actually happened, and spends a lot of time in the inferno pleading with the reader to trust him. He wants the readers to truly believe that his words are nothing but factual. As an example of his almost stupid honesty, on one occasion he was accosted by gods. He was in exile at the time and disguised as another man. One of the gods asked if he had seen Dante pass by on the road, to which Dante replied, As I walked on the road, Dante did not pass me. It's reputed that Dante had an unbelievably good memory. This reputation the poet had for having amazing recollective abilities probably came in quite handy, especially if he was ever questioned on how he could picture all of the afterlife from a dream with such clarity. One story goes that a passerby tried to test Dante's memory by asking him what he ate for breakfast. Dante replied, eggs. A year later, the same man approached Dante in the same place and then simply asked, how? To which Dante quickly replied, with salt. Finally, before we continue on, and seemingly quite randomly to bring up, Dante's lucky number was three. Surprisingly, this pertains to his overall work quite a lot. First of all, and most obviously, his comedy is split into three parts, Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. Each of these parts is made of 33 cantos, or segments. One is then added to the end to create 100, or Dante's perfect number. There are three rivers in Dante's vision of hell. He describes three classes of sin in the Inferno. The metaphor continues into Purgatorio and Paradiso, when you include things like the Holy Trinity. In Dante's work, very little is without meaning. Upon reaching the city gates, the poets find a thousand angry sinners barring entry to the inner walls. Virgil takes the group aside and talks to them in private. It helps that Dante is so terrified that he can barely hear what they're saying anyway. A few moments go by when suddenly the sinners say, You may pass, weary soul from limbo, but only you. The sinners open the gate and offer Virgil entry. They look over to Dante and one of them scornfully says, Go back home. The living are not welcome to pass here. Dante starts speaking to his readers directly about how mortified he feels towards heading back alone. He shouts and begs Virgil to return with him. Virgil turns to Dante in reply and tells the frightened poet that he will take care of the problem that is in front of them. Virgil approaches the gate to scold the sinners and they react by slamming the gate in his face. This is the first occasion in which Virgil has been indicated to have failed in some degree. Virgil is furious, but he turns to Dante again and gestures at him not to worry. When Christ harrowed hell, the sinners refused him entry into the city. Then as now, a messenger of heaven will help gain his entry. Virgil tries to console Dante, but the ancient poet is so angry and unnerved that his words stutter as he speaks. Dante reacts by becoming more on edge than he's ever been noticing a distinct lapse in confidence from his formerly self-assured guide. Dante asks Virgil if anyone from Limbo has ever been this far into hell before. He's basically asking Virgil if he knows what he's doing. Virgil states in reply that he himself has actually travelled to the deepest levels of the Inferno. Virgil is showing to Dante that he has complete and extensive knowledge of hell. Dante spots three snake-haired women hanging from the rafters of the city walls. Virgil disgustedly identifies them as the Furies. He names them as Megara, Electo, and Tisiphone. The three of them point their claws at Dante and cry at him. Medusa's coming to turn you to stern. Virgil tells Dante to avert his eyes and moves to cover Dante's face with his hands to protect him from Medusa. After all, if Dante is turned to stone, he can never leave the Inferno. A bright light explodes around the two poets. They turn and witness the arrival of Heaven's messenger. It wafts its hand as if to clear the air and many souls are thrown aside under its powerful swipe. It disciplines the sinners with fury and aggression. You dare block the gate for these travellers. You cannot resist the irresistible will of God. With another sweeping gesture of the messenger's arm, the gate effortlessly flies open. The messenger leaves just as quickly as it arrived. The poets proceed into the city in awe. When walking through the city gate, Dante and Virgil finally enter the sixth circle. Dante describes a wide field of open flaming tombs. The tombs are different shapes and sizes, 
and within can be heard the screams of sinners trapped in their own personal fiery pits. Virgil explains that this is where the arch heretics are punished. Inside these tombs are all of the leaders of heretical cults and their followers. Virgil tells Dante that there are far more of them in this circle than Dante would even think of. The pair of poets turn right and enter a secret path inside the circle. Dante asks if he can speak to one of the sinners, and Virgil responds that one will soon reveal itself to him. Virgil states, These tombs will be exposed until Judgment Day. The sinners within were followers of Epicurus, the Greek philosopher. Epicurus preached a doctrine that the soul died with the body, and now he and his followers suffer as the dead among the dead. A voice calls out to Dante, recognizing his accent as Tuscan. Virgil urges Dante to go and speak with the sinner, who is now standing up in his grave. Dante immediately identifies the sinner as Farinata degli Uberti, a great political enemy. Farinata was a Ghibelline aristocrat born in 1212. He led the Ghibelline faction within Florence during Dante's earlier years. After dying in 1264, his body was exhumed and tried for heresy. The trial concluded that Farinata believed, as Epicurus believed, that the soul died within the body. Farinata asks a fearful Dante, Who are your ancestors? Our poet responds and Farinata becomes sad. The sinner recognises that both he and Dante's family have shared very bad blood. Out of nowhere, another voice suddenly pipes up and frantically starts shouting, Dante, where's my son? The man turns out to be one of Dante's political allies, named Cavalcanti de Cavalcanti. Cavalcanti's son is a close friend of Dante and coincidentally another poet. The two of them were outcasted from Florence together. Dante makes no quick gesture to answer the frenzied soul, and it slumps back into its grave in grief, believing that Dante's silence confirms his son is dead. Farinata, now interrupted, continues the previous conversation as if nothing had just happened. The pair talk about why they are enemies, and the sinner questions Dante on the split between the white and black Gelf factions. Farinata subtly prophesizes the Greek goddess Persephone, he uses her as a metaphor to say that Dante will have a tough time returning to Florence from exile. Dante asks Farinata why the dead can prophesize. We souls may see the past and we may see the future, but never the present. When all time has run dry and there is no more future to behold, the only thing we will have left is our dismal regret of the past for all eternity. Feeling bad about Cavalcanti not knowing about his son, Dante tells Farinata to inform Cavalcante that his son is actually alive. After this, Dante returns to a patient Virgil, looking depressed from Farinata's prophecy. Virgil promises to Dante that the lady, Beatrice, will clear up any misgivings Dante may have about his future. Dante's unique view on hell has over time bled into the consciousness of how hell is seen. His work is not religiously canonical, but it has still affected the perception of the Christian hell on a generalized level. Dante created the idea of an inferno where sinners are punished in ways that reflect the sins that they committed. He greatly defined and expanded on the historical representation of the seven deadly sins. He ordered them and he structured them. He put them into fixed layers and grouped offenses logically with one another. Even now, in the 21st century, References are constantly made to the deepest circle of hell, as the idea that the context of an action being spoken about is very, very bad. Ask anyone to tell you about hell, and their answer will very likely be mixed between classical theological descriptions and Dante's work. In the modern age, there are countless derivative works based on Dante's depictions. Classically speaking, there are many musical compositions inspired by the poem, there are paintings and other art pieces stretching back centuries, and there are over a hundred English translations of the work. In the modern day you have video games, comic books and movies based on Dante's work. As the times evolve, the poem is still moving into newer forms of digital media, like this video you're watching right now. Take a quick second to reflect that this video is narrated by a man from England, 700 years after the original Italian poem was first written. Even among its peers, with epics considerably longer, and sometimes arguably better written, Dante's work seems to endlessly endure within theology, literature, and public consciousness.
Let's catch up with our poets back in Circle 6. Virgil leads Dante into a disgusting smelling valley. The stench is coming from more burning tombs. One of the tombs states that it holds Pope Anastasius. This Pope denied the divinity of Jesus. Virgil says to Dante, Let us wait a short while until we are used to this vile smell. The pair brace themselves behind some large boulders and take a brief rest. Instead of wasting their time, Virgil decides it is time to explain the perhaps overdue structure of hell to his companion. Virgil kicks off his explanation of hell by starting at circle number 7. The pair will soon enter into this circle. Circle 7, Virgil says, is split into three smaller subcircles, and each of these indicates a particular form of violence. Those who practice violence against their neighbours, like murderers, rapists, and warmongers, reside within the first subcircle. There is no distinction here between violence against a person and violence against a person's property. Sinners guilty of crimes like arson are placed in this subcircle. Suicides reside in the second subcircle. It's a place where those who committed violence against their own bodies are punished. Finally, in the third subcircle resides the blasphemers and the usurers, or the high interest moneylenders. Those who were guilty of crimes against God, art, and nature are sent here. Virgil immediately moves on to describing the sinners punished in circle number eight. He explains, In the eighth level, the fraudsters are punished. The magicians, the thieves, the hypocrites, and the falsifiers suffer from enriching themselves with lies. Fraud is so specifically a human trait, denying the bond of love that all men have from nature. Finally, Virgil describes circle number nine, the deepest level of this inferno. Within the final level of this pit can be found the treacherous, the traitors, those that fraudulize their loved ones. They not only denied their bond with their love of nature, but their bond with the love of their friends. Dante is confused, and he asks Virgil why God doesn't punish all of the previous sinners as equally as those that will come. Shouldn't God treat all sinners the same? Why are all the sinners not confined within the city of Dis? Virgil frustratingly scolds Dante for his idiocy of presuming sins are black and white. Whilst the sins outside of the city are damnable, they are not malicious. Francesca de Rimini did not have an affair specifically to hurt her husband and the avaricious did not intend to harm others with their greed. Virgil reminds Dante of Aristotle's book, which divides sin into three classes of evil. Incontinence, which is self-control, mad bestiality, which is violence, and malice, which is fraud. All prior sinners were sufferers of incontinence. Lust, gluttony, avarice, prodigality, wrath, sullenness, all fall into this category. Incontinence is the least offensive of the three classes, to God. Dante asks Virgil about the sin of moneylending and why it falls into the same category as violence against God. Virgil responds that man's labour follows the will of God and that earning a living off of one's own back is therefore in line with the natural order. Moneylenders generate money unnaturally and are therefore sinners against nature. Dante was a great believer that art, or in this case industry, was a defining characteristic of the nature of man. Virgil notices changes in the sky's constellations and gestures to Dante that the two of them should continue onwards into the seventh circle. The poets descend down a steep decline which Dante compares to the landslides of Marco. At the bottom they encounter the half-man, half-bull minotaur from Greek legend. It bites itself as they approach. The minotaur is perfect as a guardian of the violent because of its bestial nature. Virgil taunts the Minotaur by stating, Dante was not your slayer, Theseus, beast, but a mortal who was only here to witness your endless torment. The Minotaur charges at the two of them, blinded by rage. The poets flee down the landslide to safety. Once free from the Minotaur, Virgil explains how the landslide came to be. He says that he saw Christ rapture souls from hell when he last visited this deep into the pit. The echo of pure love rumbled the universe, and that rumble caused the rubbled path. The poets are now in the seventh circle proper.
It's important to point out that Dante wasn't just any regular man back when the poem was released. Dante was quite a famous and successful statesman. He had a history of political office and a reputation for being impartial and uncorrupted. He was also very intelligent with a ridiculously diverse education. His education importantly included incredible prowess in linguistics. Dante discarded full Latin for his works and wrote in a common dialect that he promoted and greatly advertised called Italian. Italian was pulled from various regional variations, most chiefly Tuscany. There were also some pieces of Latin in there for good measure. This masterstroke made Dante basically the father of the modern Italian language. Some people in France actually still refer to Italian as la language de Dante because of his massive influence on the original conception. This new way of presenting language meant that regular people could mostly understand what Dante was writing about. The poem wasn't initially widespread just because of its content, but because it was one of the first to be readable by a larger, more varied group of people. The reaction to this was that scholars were given a canvas outside of Latin to present their literative works for the first time, cascading down many new and exciting stories that were no longer consigned to the elite and the educated. After escaping the infamy of Crete, which is what Dante names the Minotaur, our two poets approach a river of boiling blood called the Phlegathon. Within it are those that were violent against their neighbours, covered in the blood of the river just as they were covered in blood in their lifetimes. As any soul tries to leave the river, it is immediately set upon by one of a thousand angry centaurs. The centaur fires an arrow at it to put it back in its place. Virgil and Dante are suddenly set upon by many of the centaurs lining the river. Virgil demands to see the centaur leader. He yells, Bring me Chiron. He names a few of the centaurs to Dante as they jostle Chiron forward to speak. Dante is actually doing very peculiar things, like moving rocks as he walks. Chiron asks the other centaurs if they notice that Dante is causing changes to the environment. Virgil confirms that Dante is a living man, and explains to the centaurs, We are on a journey from God, and you will do well to assist us. He demands an accompaniment of a herd of centaur warriors, and for Dante to ride on Chiron's back. Virgil wants the centaurs to guide them to a shallow part of the river, so that Dante may pass through it safely and unobstructed. After some negotiations, Chiron selects Nessus, the being who raped the wife of Hercules and inadvertently caused his death. Chiron tells Nessus to protect and guide the pair and allow them to ride on his back. Whilst trotting towards the shallows of the bloody boiling river, Dante sees screaming sinners flailing inside. Virgil instructs Dante to listen to Nessus for a while. Nessus names a few of the souls within this first subcircle. One of the souls, up to his throat in blood, is named as Guy de Montford, the murderer of Prince Henry. There's Azalino and Apizo de Esti, Ghibellines with violent intentions. Nessus tells of Dionysus I and II, colloquially named the Tyrants of Sicily. He points out Alexander the Great and Attila the Hun, or as Dante names him, the Scourge of God. Dante notices that the depth of blood changes according to the nature of the sinner. Some were ankle deep, and others were completely submerged. After finally passing through the river, Dante dismounts Nessus, and the two poets continue on without him. Dante and Virgil find themselves heading towards a pathless woodland. Walking into the trees away from the river, Dante instantly notices something wrong with the place. The trees have black leaves and unruly poisonous briars. They bear no fruit, and their branches are being gnawed on by strange horrific winged creatures. Virgil says, we are now in the realm of the Harpies, the corrupt and inverted angels which taunted Aeneas. He tells Dante they are now in the second subcircle. Dante hears disembodied voices all around him and becomes very fearful. He sees nobody around to make such noises. Virgil speaks to Dante and says the souls are within the forest around him. He commands Dante to break off a branch of one of the trees so that he may discover the truth of this place. The tree begins to bleed black blood, and it complains at Dante for harming it, accusing the poet of having no pity. The tree's voice sounds like burning wood and spitting sap. The tree explains that he and the rest of those in the forest were once the souls of men. 
Dante drops the branch to the floor, suddenly terrified and confused. Virgil says to the tree that he is sorry for Dante, and that Dante didn't listen to him properly when he broke off the branch. Had Dante recognised the words in what Virgil had once written, this would not have happened to the tree. He says to the tree that the pain is necessary to teach Dante, and that he feels for its suffering. He offers the tree recompense of telling Dante his story, so that Dante can repeat it when back in the living world. The tree is the soul of Pietro della Vigna, an Italian diplomat. He was a chancellor and a secretary to Emperor Frederick II. Della Vigna was born in 1190, and he rose to power very quickly, dealing as a high-ranking diplomat between the Emperor and the Pope. After being falsely accused of hurting the dignity of the Italian sovereign, he was thrown in jail. After a while, the Emperor came to visit him, and in his weakened state he was unable to speak to defend himself of his accused actions. Pietro was blinded by having his eyes removed by the prison guard. He begged for mercy of death, but it was not provided to him. So in 1249, he killed himself by smashing his head against a wall until his brain was dashed from his skull. Delavigne says, Envy is a poisonous woman of the night. She was my downfall. I was loved by Emperor Frederick II, and those around me spread vicious rumours and jealousy. I killed myself in disgust of those lies. Delavigne begs Dante to clear his name once he returns to the real world. Virgil gives Dante a chance to ask questions, but Dante feels so bad for the soul, he doesn't have the will to ask. Virgil starts asking questions in Dante's stead. He asks how one becomes a tree, and if it's possible to be saved from such a fate. Delavigne responds, It is clear to me that I am no more the spirit of a man. When Minos judges us and throws us to our determined punishment, we find ourselves in this forest with no path to walk on. We stop in our tracks, take root, and join the others as trees tortured by harpies forever. We long to be returned to our bodies so much that we fashion these wooden bodies to be our own. Because of this, on Judgment Day, when our soul and body are supposed to be reunited, our true skin will do nothing but lay on our stumps. A commotion suddenly breaks out, and Dante sees two naked men running from a pack of dogs. The slower soul begs to be killed, and the faster mocks him for being slow. The faster jumps into a thorny bush, and the hounds rip him apart, carrying off the pieces. These two sinners represent the spendthrifts, the reckless squanderers. They didn't destroy their own lives, but they destroyed their means to live. The squanderers here were not sufferers of incontinence like those in Circle 4, but deliberately did this to themselves. Dante and Virgil approach the bush and it cries out in pain. It states the soul gained nothing by choosing him as his hiding place. Virgil asks who he is, and the bush replies by asking the two poets to gather up all of his lost leaves and twigs. He states that he was a Florentine citizen who hanged himself. He predicts that Florence will never be at peace. Dante, also with a love of Florence, is sympathetic to the sinner, and he gathers all of the lost leaves as best as he can. The two poets head further onwards once more. You've already seen a lot of art in this series depicting Dante's Inferno. The most important pieces among these are by far the works by Gustave Doré. Doré was responsible for images like this. And this. And this. He created his Inferno works in 1861, during a time when Dante's comedy was becoming unbelievably popular in France. Many critics of the time wrote about how both Dory and Dante shared some kind of combined almost psychic connection with Inferno. To date, his Dante artwork has occurred in over 200 publications and it is the de facto artistic representation of the Divine Comedy. What about music? Well, you have Tchaikovsky's Francesca da Rimini, which sounds like this. Franz Litz also produced a number of classical melodies based on the comedy. Here's one called Dante Sonata.
Claudio Monteverdi, in the early 1600s, quoted directly the words entombing the gates of Dante's hell in his opera, L'Orfeo. Finally, what about other literative works? John Milton, the poet who wrote the incredible poem Paradise Lost, had an avid knowledge of Dante's work, utilising some of his ideas inside of his own poems. Karl Marx, the historical inspiration for Marxism and eventually communism, copied quotes from Dante's Purgatorio directly in his book on capitalism. And finally, Geoffrey Chaucer, the father of English literature, was a massive lover of Dante's works. He personally translated them, and he referenced them a lot in his own literature. The point is that throughout history, all of these tiny references come together as a whole. They can be used to shine a light on some of the massive exposure that Dante's Divine Comedy has gained through the works of other people. Many of these people, great influencers themselves. Is it really any wonder that Dante's poem has endured so long? In the middle of the forest, in a clearing, the poets find themselves on a dusty, flat field. Dante describes this new area as an island of sand in the middle of a forest, and more explicitly, a horrible art of justice. Huge flocks of naked sinners litter around the plain. The sinners are running, laying or sitting, whilst it rains giant flakes of fire on top of them. The fire ignites the sand like kindling, burning the sinners even more. The ones that are laying make the most noise, because they are the most burned. These are the blasphemers, the violent against God. The running sinners are those who are guilty of crimes against nature. Finally, the sitting sinners are the violent against art, high interest moneylenders, which Virgil explained about in part 5 of this rundown. Laying alone in the sand appears a giant man shouting insults at God. When overhearing these insults, Dante asks Virgil who he is, and the man angrily sits up and replies for himself. He proclaims his anger and defiance at God. Jove will never be able to take revenge upon me for my sins. Even if Jove blasted down all his lightning bolts, he would never succeed. The sinner next speaks a very important line of information. He says, That as I was in life, will I always be in death. This is crucial because it puts front and centre the main issue which up until now has been overlooked. The issue being that in hell, sinners do not seem to grow or change or repent. The sinners are forever the same. This can be represented in the case of Cavalcante back in Circle 6. Cavalcante cares a lot more about his son than his own eternal punishment. In fact, most of the characters that Dante sees put across an indication that they care very little about their current circumstances at all. Sinners in Dante's Inferno create their own hell because of who they are. They are almost totally unaware of their suffering. Capaneus, as Virgil names him, is reprimanded by the poets. Virgil says, It is your own arrogance which torments you, and will always torment you. Capaneus cares very little for Virgil's words. Dante recognises Capaneus' name as one of the seven kings that fought against Thebes. So that Dante doesn't burn his feet, Virgil tells him to walk along the sand's edge closer to the forest. Dante notices a small red flowing stream which reminds him of bath water provided to Italian prostitutes in Florence. After asking Virgil its purpose, Virgil tells a short tale. On an island named Crete, the centre of the world and home of the Minotaur is a mountain. Inside of that mountain is a statue called the Old Man of Crete. The statue is made of many kinds of materials, metals, clays, etc. All of these different materials represent different facets of mankind. The statue faces towards Rome, the centre of the Catholic religion. Virgil explains that the floor beneath the statue is cracked. Through that crack, flow tears that emerge from the statue's head. Its tears are the waters of the sins of man. They filter through the earth through the crack and become the three rivers of hell, Acheron, Styx and Phlegathon. This tale drills down even further that Dante is presenting a hell which is both physically and spiritually 
created by mankind. The poets are now walking along the Phlegathon once more within this subcircle. They are walking past the Sodomites. The sinners on the sandy plain gaze over to the poets lustfully and squintingly smile like tailors staring at needles. They're rushing around trying to avoid the flames. A soul suddenly shouts out from among the sinners to Dante that this encounter is quite amazing. He says it is wonderful to see him. Dante struggles to make out the sinner from his burns, and he asks if he is Brunetto Latini, his old mentor. Brunetto confirms and says, We shall walk together. If I stop moving, I will be forced to lay under fiery rains for a century. Brunetto and Dante share a very familial father-son relationship. Brunetto actually refers to Dante as my son throughout the exchange, and Dante speaks in a very respectful and honourable tone in return, something that he doesn't offer to all the sinners. They speak about each other's work, and Brunetto talks about how he wishes he was still alive to help encourage Dante in his pursuits. Brunetto prophesizes that Dante will be hunted by both Guelphs and Ghibellines in his future. This had already come to pass by the time of writing Inferno. Brunetto mentions three sinners that exist within this circle when asked by Dante, Prishkin, Francesco de Corso, and Bishop Andrea de Mozzi. After this, he suddenly says that he has to depart. Brunetto indicates that sinners are arriving who he doesn't want to be associated with. Before leaving, Brunetto advises Dante to speak of his book, The Tesoro. He says to our poet that even though he is dead, through his works he will live on forever. Dante and Virgil begin to approach a waterfall, which flows off of a cliff into the eighth circle. Dante witnesses three burned souls rushing up from the opposite direction. The men are from Florence, and Virgil urges Dante to speak with them. The three sinners form a ring around the poets, so they can keep moving whilst they talk. They recognise Dante by his clothes, saying that he is from their indecent country. They name themselves as Guido Guerra, Tagayo Aldobrandi, and Jacopo Rusticucci. Dante recognises them as Guelphs that tried to dissuade other Florentines from fighting at Monteperti. Jacopo asks Dante if Florence is still a good place. He remarks that all of the newcomers he sees are saying bad things. Dante yells loudly that Florence is suffering from excess and pride. The three sinners praise him for his powerful words, and then depart. The poets follow the bloody river to its end. Virgil orders Dante to loosen his rope belt. Virgil throws it over the precipice of the cliff. Dante feels that this is slightly strange, but he trusts his guide. Dante is expecting something to happen, and Virgil, seemingly reading his mind, confirms that what will happen will happen very soon. Behold the beast, whose stench fills all the world. A monster emerges from the waterfall beneath them, called by the throwing of the cord. The beast has the innocent face of a man, two giant wings, a poisonous scorpion-like tail, the body of a serpent, and a hide braided into knots. Virgil tells Dante that this beast is their path forwards. Dante spends the next few moments imploring his reader that what he is seeing is true, no matter how outlandish and unbelievable it sounds. Just as they reach it, Virgil spots three sinners sat on the burning floor nearby. He tells Dante to go over and talk to them whilst he negotiates for the beast to carry them to the Eighth Circle. Dante walks understandably quickly away from the strange-looking monster to the three sinners. These are the high-interest moneylenders, and they're wearing pouches around their necks which they stare at. The pouches are emblazoned with family crests, but Dante doesn't recognise anyone there. One of them spots the poet and is incredibly rude to him. He yells at Dante, telling him to leave them alone. Dante casually compares them to Oxen and retreats back to Virgil. Virgil has succeeded in gaining the beast's trust. He tells Dante to mount the monster's shoulders to be protected from the venomous tail at the back. Dante feels shame that he has a lot of fear whilst Virgil is showing none. He mounts the creature all the same. Virgil embraces Dante so that he is securely attached to the beast. Next, he calls the monster by name, Gerion informing it to take off and carry them gently. The beast steps off the cliff like a boat meeting the seas, and begins flight. Dante is terrified. He imagines himself as Icarus, about to meet the sun for his reckless daring. 
the beast gently circles downwards alongside the waterfall. At the bottom, the two poets climb off of Geryon and it flies away. The poets have now arrived in the eighth circle. In around 1315, Inferno was completed. Soon after this, Florence was forced by the leader of the military free company in charge, a man named Uguccione, to grant amnesty to any Guelph that was in exile. This was done under the condition that a heavy fine be paid by those provided amnesty. While some took up the offer, Dante strictly refused. He stated that he preferred exile to begging dishonorably to return to his home. After Uguccione was killed in the siege of Padua in 1318, Dante received another offer to return to Florence. His death sentence was to be commuted if Dante accepted house arrest. This was also done under the condition that Dante swear he never enter the Florence main city again. Dante once more refused, and in reaction, Florence extended his existing death sentence to his sons. Dante already felt like his exile was his death sentence, as he was cut off from much of his family, his heritage and his history. He hoped that he would be welcomed home honourably someday, but fully expected to never return. Much of Dante's later professional life revolved around diplomacy. Remember that he was a valuable politician and statesman with a lot of respect. In 1321, Dante completed work on Paradiso. Very soon after this, he likely contracted malaria and he died when returning from a diplomatic journey to Venice. He never achieved his wish to go back home. Dante's body was buried in Ravenna, where he spent a lot of his exile. On his gravestone are some words by Dante's friend Bernardo Canaccio. They say, Florence, mother of little love. In 2008, Nearly 700 years after Dante was thrown out of his beloved home, the municipality of Florence officially apologised for expelling him. Our poets now look over the eighth circle of hell. Dante describes it as male bogge, roughly translated as evil pouches or evil pockets. The circle is a cavern of dull reddish coloured rocks. Hewn into the stone are ten trench-like chasms where different aspects of fraud are punished. Dante describes it like a series of moats with bridges built across them. The closer you get to the centre, the more serious the sin and the worse the punishment is. Our poets walk towards the first trench, or as Dante calls it, the first pouch. The new sinners inside walk back and forth alongside the two walls of the pouch. They are the panderers and seducers. When the sinners reach a demon standing on top of the pouch, they are whipped by that demon and forced to walk the opposite direction. Amidst the souls, Dante spots Venedicio Caccianamico. The soul tries to hide its face. Dante asks Venedicio what brought him to hell. Reluctantly, the soul states that he managed to get his sister, Gisola, to do sexual favours for a marquee for money. This makes him a panderer, or almost like a pimp. A demon intervenes suddenly and strikes Venedicio, telling him to move on. The poets continue onwards towards a small bridge, and Virgil says to Dante, Peer upon the souls wandering aside that wall. Dante sees Jason of the Argonauts amongst the tortured souls. He is punished for abandoning Hypsipyle. He promised her fidelity and sailed away anyway, forgetting his vows. This makes him one of the seducers. Upon reaching the second pouch, a putrid smell drifts over the pit. Dante sees souls consumed in a mound of excrement and sewage. They sigh and they cry out, these actions turning into mold on their bodies. Dante feels as if he recognises a man, but as he points him out to Virgil, the man goes wild, demanding Dante explain why he picked him out amongst the filth. 
Dante confirms the sinner is Alessio Intermine of Luca. Alessio states that he suffers for his endless false flattery. The punishment in this pouch reflects the sinner's flattery as excrement. The sinner retreats back into the filth. Virgil points out another soul named Thace. She was a prostitute who is punished for thanking her lovers excessively and insincerely after sex. Virgil says they have seen enough of this pouch and the pair turn away to continue onwards. Our poets move on to pouch number three. Dante knows immediately that this is the pouch of the Simonists. Simonists are holy men who sell their power to perform favours for others. Their punishment is to be buried upside down in holes the size of baptism basins, with only their feet protruding from the rock. The soles of their feet are also on fire. Their punishment is eternal suffocation and immolation. One of the souls has a much hotter flame than the others, and is clearly enduring much more torment than any of the other sinners present. Dante decides to go down and get a closer look. The sinner is Pope Nicholas III. Nicholas says, Ah, oh, Boniface, I'm surprised you have arrived in hell so soon to take my place. The sinner is confusing Dante for Pope Boniface VIII. Our poet corrects him, stunned that he is being compared to a man that he hates so much. Nicholas tells his story and explains this pouch of hell. I was once the Pope. I wore the great mantle of the papal office. In life I was a Simonist, but I promised it was only so that I could fatten the purse of my family, not myself. And for that I suffer. Nicholas explains that the successor in this punishment always takes the place of their precursor. Directly beneath him are cracks in the rock where other popes are buried. Boniface will one day come to take Nicholas's place in this inverted prison. Nicholas would then sink further into the ground to make room. It is clear that the entire bedrock here is lined with Simonists for many, many layers, completely buried upside down. Dante looks down on the sinner and asks how much Christ charged St. Peter before giving him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Nothing. Dante pronounces the punishment just and then continues for a while insulting all corrupt men of the church. At one point, he calls the papal seat a woman of the night who fornicates with kings for money. Virgil is very happy with Dante and assists him out of the pouch so that they can continue onwards. Dante is shocked to find a procession of naked souls when nearing the fourth pouch. The heads of these sinners are on backwards with their necks twisted 180 degrees. As they suffer, they weep with their tears dripping down to their buttocks. These are the fortune tellers and diviners punished for wishing to see the future a realm of God's knowledge. These people are forced to walk backwards because that is the only direction they are now permitted to see. Virgil scolds Dante for feeling any pity towards these sinners at all. He looks down on them all, judgmentally. Virgil points out Ampharaeus, a king who foresaw his own defeat and then ran from it. He also points out the grotesque witch Manto. Virgil sidetracks a little to tell the story of his hometown's origins. I am from the town of Mantua, named for that witch, Manto. Manto ran from war-torn Thebes after the death of her father. She settled in a foul-smelling marshland. Others came to realize that the marsh was unassailable and settled there as well, forming the town. I dare you, Dante, to discredit my interpretation of this tale. Dante concedes authority to Virgil in this matter and asks Virgil to name more of the souls. Virgil does so, pointing out Calchas from his own Aeneid and as Dente, the soothsayer. Virgil says that the moon is sinking to the horizon, so they should make haste onwards. The poets move over to pouch number five. Pouch five of Circle Eight is very dark and filled with boiling pitch. It is the pouch of the berators, the corrupt politicians. Dante compares the blackness to tar that is used to coat the seams of Venetian ships. He struggles to make out what's happening and steps forward to get a closer look. Virgil shouts for him to beware and tugs him back. Suddenly, a giant black-winged demon rushes out towards him. 
it is carrying a sinner on its shoulder. The demon throws the soul into the boiling pitch below and calls for other demons to keep the sinner in there as he heads off for more people to throw. The sinner bobs on the surface of the pitch and a group of demons nearby force the soul to stay under the boiling liquid with long spiked prongs. Virgil hides Dante behind a rock so he can negotiate with the demons for safe passage across the pitch. He says to the frightened poet, Stay quiet and hidden for now. Do not draw their attention. Fearless, Virgil steps out to meet the demons and is immediately flocked by a large group of them. They threaten Virgil with their prongs, but Virgil holds his ground. He yells, You think I have traveled here without divine assistance? Bring me Malakota. The demons suddenly drop their aggressive stance. Malakota, translated as Evil Tail, is the leader of the demons. When he arrives, Virgil explains Dante's heavenly journey. Malakoda tells Dante to come out of his hiding place, and Dante is poked jokingly by some demons as he rushes to Virgil's side. The demon leader reprimands the other demons, and pledges ten of his number to helping the pair pass through to the next pouch. This is under the condition that their work is unhindered along the way. Unfortunately, he says that the bridge to pass beyond this point has collapsed, but says that the demons will help them reach an intact one a little bit further away. When referencing the broken bridge, he says that it fell in an earthquake exactly 1,266 years, one day, and five hours before this point. He is subtly referencing the far-reaching effects of Christ's harrowing of hell. Dante has reservations about travelling with a pack of demons and pleads with his guide to leave them behind. Virgil scolds him in return, reminding Dante that the demons here exist merely to punish those trapped in the pitch, nothing more. Virgil accepts the assistance of the demons, and the group moves onwards. As they head to the next bridge, Dante starts to realise the necessity of his demonic companions. He examines the pitch, and sometimes sees various limbs sticking out of it, with sinners trying to get relief to some of their body parts. The demons fly down constantly to poke them back in. Some of the souls wade on the shallows of the pitch, mostly exposed, and whenever a demon comes close, they scurry back underneath the pitch in fear. Eventually, one sinner is too slow to react, and the demons pounce on him. They tug him by his hair, and motion to tear him apart with their hooks and prongs. Dante asks Virgil if it is possible to speak to the sinner before that happens. Virgil steps forth and asks the soul his birthplace. The sinner reveals that he was a clergyman born in Navarre who accepted bribes whilst working for King Thibault. Virgil then watches as one of the demons slices into the soul, and he continues his interrogation by asking, Are there any Italians nearby? As the sinner tries to reply, the demons continue to tear at him. He manages to spurt out that he was recently near an Italian man. Virgil finally discerns his name, Fragamita. The soul pleads to be spared if he can trick seven Italians to surface from the pitch. The demons are initially suspicious, but they agree to the terms. They release the soul from its torture, but instead of doing as he said, Fragomita dives back into the relative safety of the pitch, much to the anger of the demons. The demons begin to fight one another for letting the soul talk in the first place, and two of them fall into the pitch during the scuffle. Dante and Virgil sneak away, whilst the pair of creatures are being fished out by other demons. Whilst escaping, Dante becomes terrified that the demons may be very angry. Virgil concurs with his frightened partner and suggests they move quickly down a ridge into the next pouch. The demons, now free, begin chasing them. As the demons get closer and closer, Virgil snatches Dante up protectively like a mother and slides down the ridge quickly into the next pouch. The demons cannot follow and they howl and cry on the border of pouches 5 and 6. They are restricted by God to remain only in their own pouch and have failed in their chase. The two poets start to move through the sixth pouch, and they see souls wearing brightly gilded cloaks wandering around slowly and aimlessly. Their cloaks are, on the inside, lined with lead, making them heavy and torturous to wear. The appearance of these souls remind Dante of Benedictine monks in Cluny Abbey. Dante asks Virgil to look for someone recognisable or famous that he can talk to. The pair slow down to the pace of the sinners to make this easier. 
Two souls nearby overhear Dante's Tuscan accent and beckon the poets over to them. The sinners present themselves as jovial friars named Catalano and Lodoringo. They are representatives of both Guelph and Ghibelline factions. They were brought into Florence to help keep the peace, but secretly provoked war and violence. One of the sinners explains the cloaks that they wear. We are the hypocrites. We presented beliefs we did not truly hold. On the outside, our cloaks are golden and beautiful, but deep inside is its inner truth. They ask Dante where he's from, noticing that he is alive by his throat moving whilst he talks. They also ask what he's doing in this pouch of hypocrites. Dante explains himself, and he is about to start talking down to them for their sins, but suddenly notices a giant soul crucified to the ground. Catalano explains to the poets that the man Dante is peering at is Caiaphas. Caiaphas was a Jewish priest, and the head of the council that recommended Jesus be killed, despite Caiaphas knowing that he was innocent. The soul has to bear the weight of all souls present walking over him for eternity. The same punishment is given to this man's father-in-law, Annas, who brought Jesus to the council in the first place, as well as other council members who condemned Jesus. Virgil stares at Caiaphas for a long while. He has not seen this type of punishment before. The last time he entered this deep into hell, Jesus had not yet been crucified. Virgil then turns and he asks the friars if there's any way to move on without re-stepping into the path of the demons in pouch 5. The friars point to a nearby ridge and say, There are no intact bridges near here. You can continue forwards that way by climbing the broken bridge there. Virgil scorns the demons for lying about there being a solid bridge to cross. The friars mock him, asking if he truly trusted the word of a demon in hell. Virgil is weightless, but Dante is not, so Virgil helps the living poet in his climb. He keeps a close watch for loose rocks that Dante might slip on or dislodge. Dante tells the reader how he would have given up if it was not for Virgil. The poets now look down on the seventh pouch and see a mass of serpents writhing within. In this pouch, Dante is witnessing the horrific punishment of the thieves. Naked sinners run around the pouch, chased by snakes. The snakes bind themselves around the sinners' hands and feet. After this, another snake appears and bites the bound soul. When the snake bites, its venom makes the soul ignite into flame and turn to ash. Moments later, the soul is reborn like a phoenix from those ashes and the serpents attack again. When the sinners return, they are bewildered and confused, unable to comprehend what just happened to them. Dante witnesses a soul come back and asks him who he is. The sinner regains composure before answering Vanni Fucci from Pistoia. Dante recognizes the soul as a man of blood and anger. He wonders why this man doesn't suffer in the punishments of violence. Fucci says he stole holy relics from the Pistoia Cathedral. The sinner becomes ashamed that Dante has discovered his truth, saying that the discovery angers him more than his eternal punishment. In revenge, Fucci goes on to predict that the Black Gelfs will suffer a great defeat in Pistoia at the hands of the White Gelfs. Then Dante's beloved Whites will truly fall. In reality, victory in Pistoia drove the Blacks there to join up with the Blacks in Florence, empowering them. The battle in Pistoia was a precursor to Dante's exile. Fucci tells Dante to be full of grief. As he finishes, he blasphemes against God, losing all of Dante's remaining respect. Snakes coil around Fucci as if in response to his words, and the soul flees. In Fucci's place appears a centaur with writhing snakes for a tail. He asks the pair if they've seen Fucci. The human parts of this creature are tortured by a miniature dragon which sets its skin aflame. Virgil explains that this centaur doesn't reside with his kind in Circle 7 because he is Cacus, the centaur who stole cattle from Hercules. Virgil states that Hercules administered 100 blows against the thief, but Cacus was already dead by blow 10. Three nude sinners walk by, and one of them shouts to the pair asking who they are. Dante doesn't immediately recognize them. One of them asks about someone named Chafna, and a giant lizard with six legs suddenly appears. The lizard attacks one of the sinners named Agnello. It brutalizes Agnello's face with its massive jaws and clamps down on him tightly with its legs. 
the lizard squeezes him so strongly that the two of them begin to melt together in a twisted, sickly way. Dante describes it like the blending of two colours of hot wax. The result is a man-snake abomination, neither fully snake nor fully man. A small creature appears to run up to one of the two remaining salts. It bites him on the belly button without him realising. The sinner and creature begin to stare at each other, transfixed. The man then yawns as if he's tired. In extraordinary graphic detail, the pair start to swap forms. The reptile disfigures and grows into a man, and the man becomes scaly and distorted, turning into a reptile. The newly erected soul turns to the final soul of the initial group and says that he wanted Buoso, as he names him, to run on all fours like he did. As they are leaving, Dante recognises another sinner, the fifth such Florentine citizen in this pouch. Dante sarcastically insults Florence by saying how great it is that Florence is just as popular in hell as it is in the real world. He predicts that one day other cities like Prato will battle Florence for its riches, and it will be all too satisfying. Dante and Virgil move onwards to pouch number 8. Past a jagged stairway of difficult to pass rocks, Dante finally stands on the edge of a deep chasm. Within that abyss, he sees little flames moving around. He says that the motion of the flames are like Elijah's flaming chariots, rising to heaven as a star. Virgil says, The dancing lights on which you peer contain the centers of this pouch. They are hidden by the flames which surround them. This is the pouch of the deceptive counselors. Dante is curious, and so looks over the edge of their raised position for a better view. He sees a unique flame split into two, like flaming horns. The flames then begin to approach our poets together. Dante asks Virgil to explain which sinners suffer beneath these particular flames. Virgil replies that they are Ulysses and Diomedes. Due to their sins, they are punished together in a single joint flame. The two sinners were single-handedly responsible for the deception of the Trojan horse. They also had a hand in the theft of Pallas, a sacred religious idol of Athena at the Palladium. Dante urges Virgil to let him speak to them. Virgil agrees with the sentiment, but he says that they may look down on Dante, them being Greek and he speaking Italian. Virgil asks Ulysses how he died. The bigger of the two flames wags back and forth like a tongue as the sinner within replies. This represents their sin as evil counsellors. When we returned from the Trojan War, we explored more than we intended. We sailed past Spain and the Pillars of Hercules, but I thirsted for more. We sailed to the southern hemisphere where the stars are upside down and finally reached the mountain of purgatory. God judged that we would travel too far and raised a whirlwind against our ship, killing us all. Virgil permits the pair of souls to leave, and another sinner approaches the poets. The new sinner groans and moans in muffled, unintelligible words. Dante strains to understand the tongue flame, comparing the sounds to the noises of a Sicilian bull torture device. The sinner asks our poets to be spared punishment for just a moment for conversation. He inquires as to how his hometown of Romagna is doing. Dante replies that Romagna is never without war, but the last time he visited, there was no active strife. Dante asks the sinner who he is. Being in hell, the sinner believes that Dante will never be able to tell anyone else anyway. He thinks our poet is also a spirit. The soul starts to tell his history, but never actually states his name. He is identifiable in his description as Guida de Montefeltro. The sinner was a former soldier who repented and became a friar. As a young man, he was a turncoat and backstabber, and then he became a holy man as he aged. The Pope, who was at the time feuding with Christian families, asked Guido to name some of the families he should go to war with. He offered Guido pre-absolution of his sins for his counsel. Guido's counsel then turned out to be false after the Pope lost those battles. When Guido died, St. Francis came down to save him, but a demon appeared to snatch him up instead. The demon stated that absolution could only be given on sins a person had already committed. 
pre-absolution was not permitted. The demon delivered Guido to Minos, who then threw him into the Eighth Circle. Guido is heavily upset whilst retelling his tale, and he leaves. The poets move onwards. At pouch number 9, Dante finds it hard to speak as he witnesses the punishment for this new band of sinners. Bloody and wounded souls litter the landscape. Dante describes it as more horrendous and grotesque than the carnage of some of the worst battles combined. This is the pouch of the Sowers of Discord. The first soul that Dante sees has been split across the middle in such a state that all of his organs are visible. The sinner sees Dante and opens up his split chest wider for the poet to see, crying out to Dante that he is Muhammad. He points to another man named Ali with a face cleaved in two. Ali was responsible for the splitting of the Sunni and Shiite tribes of the Muslims. Within this pouch, the sinners walk in circles, healing constantly until they reach a demon. Muhammad tells Dante that the demons slash them and split them apart with swords. This is just as the souls split others apart in life. Muhammad asks Dante why he can walk around without having his guts on show. When Virgil explains Dante's mortality, the souls in the pouch become aware of the situation and stare at Dante. Muhammad tells Dante to deliver a message to his friend Fra Dolcino to tell him to stock up on food or else he will starve and join them in the pouch. Muhammad then walks away. Dolcino did eventually starve in the real world. Pierre de Medicina approaches our poet with his throat slit and his ear and nose cut off. He requests that Dante make him famous in the mortal realm. He then asks our poet to deliver a message to two endangered sailors. Dante says he will do so if Pierre identifies another soul for him. Pierre directs Dante's attention to Curio, the man who convinced Julius Caesar to portray his friend Pompey and attack Rome. The attack started a civil war. His mouth is split into pieces and he is unable to speak. Pierre points out another man with no hands, presenting himself as Mosca de Lamberti. He contributed to the bad blood between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines in Tuscany. Mosca requests to be remembered as well. Dante informs Mosca that he brought death to his own family, and the sinner runs away in misery. The final sinner approaches. Dante implores the reader to trust his next words. The sinner is headless, carrying his head in his hand. The sinner lifts his head like a lantern towards our poets to speak with them. He challenges Dante to find a more punished soul in hell than himself. As Bertrand de Born in life, he turned Prince Henry against his father, King Henry II. Dividing father from son was the trigger for him to be carrying his own divided head in hell. Virgil hurries Dante along. He says, there are many souls to see. We cannot speak to them all. Dante states that he believes he saw a sinner from his own family suffering in this pouch. Virgil explains that whilst Dante was speaking with Bertrand, he spotted Dante's kinsman, whom the others named Gary Del Bello, shouting insults at Dante from far away. Gary Del Bello was violently murdered in a battle between the Alighieris and the Sacchettis. As an unavenged man, he is angry at Dante but this only makes Dante pity him and feel sorrow. The two poets walk over a bridge to the tenth and final pouch of Circle Eight. Dante is forced to cover his ears as they descend the slopes into the tenth pouch. The sinners within wail in terrible agony from the might of unbelievable pestilence. Dante states that it is more rife with disease than the myth of Aegina. Aegina was an island cursed to disease by the wife of Jupiter after the god king's infidelity. This pouch, the pouch of falsifiers, stinks of rotten flesh. The souls in pouch 10 heap and crawl around, suffering from horrible illnesses. 
Dante sees two sinners propped up against each other, scratching at each other's scabs furiously. He compares the violence to malcontented stable boys taking out their frustrations on innocent horses. Dante continues by saying that they attack like kitchen knives trying to descale fish. Virgil asks them if they know any Italians nearby, and they answer that they are in fact Italian. They ask who he is and why Dante is alive, much like everybody else does. Again, Virgil explains. The two sinners and some of the souls nearby peer at Dante in amazement. Virgil gestures to Dante to ask his usual questions. Dante tells them to identify themselves, promising to make them famous when he returns to the land of the living. The first sinner tells that he made Albert of Siena angry by joking that he could teach him how to fly. This was not the crime which landed him in hell, however. This man practiced alchemy, falsification of precious metals, for which he was burned at the stake. He names himself as Griffolino d'Arezzo. Dante criticizes Siena loudly. Before Griffolino can argue his case, another sinner jumps in agreeing with Dante, naming more pompous Sienese noblemen. Capoccio, as he proudly identifies himself, was a school friend of Dante. He is also in hell for practicing alchemy. The next two sinners that Dante sees, he compares to being more violent than the tale of Jupiter and Semele and more wild than Hecuba of Troy. In the first comparison, Jupiter impregnated Semele, a beautiful princess. Juno, much like how she reacted with the pestilence in Aegina, went mad with jealousy. She drove Semele's brother-in-law insane until he thought his family were lions. He murdered one son, and his wife committed double suicide with the other in grief. In the second tale, Hecuba of Troy saw her daughter sacrificed and her son murdered. The intense grief caused her to howl like a dog. One of the two rabid sinners runs up to Capoccio and bites him on the neck. Griffolino, still intently watching, tells Dante that this sinner is called Gianni Cicci. This soul was guilty of impersonation, writing himself into a will to obtain a dead man's best horse after he died. Dante asks about the other sinner. Griffolino says that she is Mira, a princess that fell in love with her father and pretended to be someone else in order to sleep with him. Dante surveys the rest of the sinners. He sees a man swollen and bloated disgustingly. The soul manages to present himself as Adam. Adam's punishment is to be constantly thirsty forever. He can do nothing all day but imagine the river Arno near his hometown, the place where he counterfeited his coins, but he can never find water. Adam blames Guido II for his crimes, saying it was Guido that was to blame for him counterfeiting in the first place. Apparently a rumour is circling amongst the souls in this pouch that Guido is already among them, and he pledges to get his revenge. Dante asks Adam who the two sinners next to him are. They are smoking as if to catch fire. Adam names them Potiphar's wife and Sinon of the Greeks. Sinon tricked the Trojans into accepting the horse into their city. Potiphar's wife falsely accused Joseph in the Bible. Sinon starts to insult Adam for bringing this falsification to Dante's attention. The pair begin striking one another and blaming each other for being worse sinners. Dante is fascinated by the argument until Virgil scolds him. He tells Dante to stop finding enjoyment in this pointless and degrading argument. Dante speaks about Virgil's sharp speech, saying it can inflict wounds or heal at will. The two poets reconcile and move out of Circle 8. Whilst heading to the final circle, everything becomes dark. It is icy cold and strong winds batter the two poets. The pair of them strain to see, so rely heavily on their hearing. Dante makes out the silhouette of many tall towers arranged in a circle. He turns to Virgil and asks him which city this is. Peer again beyond this mist, Dante. You will see not towers, but giants encircling the ninth level of this pit. 
The poets edge towards the giants, and Dante's fear grows. Dante blesses heaven for not allowing the giants to breed on earth. Virgil starts identifying the giants, first pointing to Nimrod. Nimrod was one of the kings of ancient Babylon, responsible for the building of the Tower of Babel. Babel was so ambitious in size that it almost reached heaven. God himself struck the tower down for its arrogance. The breaking of the tower split the languages of man into thousands of dialects and tongues. Nimrod himself cannot speak, he is only capable of mumbling incoherent nothings. His punishment is to never again understand and never again be understood. Virgil says that Nimrod thoroughly deserves his punishment for breaking up the many peoples of the world into different cultures, nations and races. The poets continue until they reach another, much larger giant. This giant is chained up in massive restraint, looped five times around his body. Virgil names him as Ephialtes, the giant who challenged the gods to war. Dante asks Virgil when they will see Briareus. Briareus was another giant who challenged heaven. Virgil states, Antonius is close ahead. He will help us enter the ninth circle. And the giant of which you speak is far away and far more terrifying. Ephialtes tries to escape his bonds at the name of Briareus. His fear causes an earthquake. As the two approach Antaeus, Virgil explains the giant's origin. Dante learns that he ate lions and that, had he been born at the time of the giants, the giants would have won their war against the gods. Virgil flatters Antaeus' strength and deeds convincing the giant to deposit them in the next circle. The giant gently picks up our two poets in his palm. Dante is terrified that Antaeus is going to hurt him, but the giant crouches down and places them carefully and softly into the deepest part of the inferno. Dante cannot find the words to talk about the horrors of the Ninth Circle, but he tries his best to describe this new scene. He asks the muses to bless his words so that they may appear true, however coarse and rugged that they are. This is the final level of the Inferno, the realm of the foulest sinners, the treacherous. Walking underneath Antaeus' feet, Dante hears a soul cry to watch where he steps. He looks down and sees before him that he has stood on an enormous frozen lake, the Cositus. This frozen lake is the dead center and core of the universe. It appears like glass and is almost mirrored, becoming the metaphor that after Dante's long journey, he has learned to not only look at the evil in others, but perhaps the evil within himself. Standing inside the ice are sinners, shivering, chattering their teeth and crying. Dante realizes that there are four rings to this circle. The first ring is named Cana, after the biblical murderer Cain. This is where traitors to kin are punished. Dante sees two sinners so closely packed that their hair is conjoined. They are squashed breast to breast. Dante asks them who they are, but they mostly ignore him, butting heads with one another instead. Another sinner nearby begins to talk. He identifies the two as the Bicencio brothers, who killed one another over politics. He says that there are no two sinners more fit for Cana than this pair. The sinner states himself as Camisione di Pazzi, condemned for killing kinsmen for political power. He denies his punishment is just by claiming the evil of his kinsmen. The poets continue moving and enter Antonora, the second ring of this circle. It is named for Antonor of Troy, who unsealed his home city gates for the Greeks. This ring is devoted to traitors against their homelands or countries. 
Dante accidentally kicks the face of a sinner. The sinner pipes up and yells in sorrow to Dante, asking why he must attack him so. Dante asks for a brief moment of time from Virgil, as he hopes to clear up the misunderstanding. He roughly asks the sinner who he is. The soul replies a mirrored question, asking Dante who he is. Dante explains that he is a living man and he will grant the sinner great fame. The soul seems disinterested and just wants to be left alone. Dante grabs the soul by his hair and yells at the man to identify himself or he will continue to keep pulling the man's hair until there is none left. The soul is still defiant and not intimidated. Dante, finally demonstrating his complete contempt for the inhabitants of hell, pulls out a tuft of the sinner's hair and the soul screams loudly in pain. Another soul nearby yells to him by name to shut up. The now healer's soul is named Boccia degli Abati. Boccia betrayed the Florentine Guelphs on the field of battle. Dante threatens to tarnish Boccia's name if he doesn't answer his questions, but Boccia still remains defiant. Boccia merely asks if Dante will also tarnish the names of a few other souls as well. Dante is angry and he moves on, followed by Virgil. The poets next come across another pair of sinners. The face of one is biting tightly into the back of the other. As always, Dante wants them identified. The biting soul in reply begins to speak. He lifts his teeth from the other sinner and wipes his mouth on the lower soul's hair. The sinner says that recounting his story makes him weep, but if it exposes his betrayer, he will gladly continue. Ugolino was the magistrate of Pisa, and he made some tough decisions in life. One of those decisions was to cede Pisa to a hostile neighbouring city, which some considered betrayal. Ugolino found himself exiled from Pisa, and Archbishop Ruggieri tempted him back under false pretenses. The Archbishop locked Ugolino and his children into a Pisan tower called the Eagle Tower, but known afterwards as the Hunger Tower. They were kept there for a while as regular prisoners. As the days of imprisonment rolled on, the inmates continued to expect their normal supply of food. However, on one fateful day, instead of the guards bringing food, Ugolino heard men nailing the door to the tower shut. His insides turned at the sound and he went silent, unable to speak to his scared children. A few more days went by and one of the sons finally succumbed to hunger. He lied dead at the feet of his father. Then another son died, and another, yet Ugolino still did not speak. Eventually, after all of his children were dead and Ugolino had gone totally blind from the hunger, he called out to his children, realizing finally that they were gone. Ugolino states that fasting had more force than grief. This suggests he either died of starvation or died feasting on his own children. Dante expresses grief that Pisa, a land of great scandal, is yet unpunished on the earth. The poets move on to the third ring of Circle Nine. The sinners in the third ring are not embedded in the ice of Cassitis vertically, but horizontally, with their faces protruding from it. This ring is named Ptolemy, after Ptolemy, son of Abubus and governor of Jericho. Ptolemy murdered all of his guests at a banquet. Ptolemy houses the traitors to one's guests. The sinners in ring three cannot cry as their tears crystallize immediately, glazing over their eyes. Dante himself is going numb from the cold, and he turns to Virgil. Virgil says, The source of this cold wind will soon become clear. A sinner cries out to Dante, believing that he is a sinner himself. He asks Dante to remove the glaze from his eyes, so that he may see for a moment before going blind from tears once more. Dante promises to do this on pain of banishment to this punishment himself, if the sinner names himself and tells his story. 
the sinner says that he was Fra Alberigo. He invited his relatives over for dinner and had them assassinated. The sinner says that he does not deserve this punishment. Dante is shocked, but not by the punishment, but by the fact that Fra Alberigo is still alive. He recognises the name and the tale the sinner told. Alberigo replies, In this reign, some of us are indeed alive on the earth. At the time of our horrific sin, we were torn from our flesh prematurely and passed down into this frozen punishment. Our bodies still inhabit the world above, possessed by demons. Alberigo points out a man named Branca Doria, another man Dante knows is definitely still alive. Dante refuses to wipe the sinner's eyes like he promised. He says that by not doing so and being rude, he is giving the sinner a courtesy in hell. He curses the Genoese, to whom Branca and Alberigo belong, saying that they are so corrupt that they can go to hell before they have even died. Dante says that all demons should be wiped from the earth. As the two poets head towards the fourth and final ring of the final circle of this inferno, Virgil states, Vexilla Regis, Produnt Inferni. The banners of the king of hell draw closer. This ring is named Judeca, named for Judas Iscariot, the man who betrayed Jesus. Here are punished the traitors to their benefactors. In this final area of hell, the sinners are fully immersed in ice. The transparent glass-like lake lets them be seen in all of their twisted positions. Virgil tells Dante to look for the source of the cold wind in this final ring. Dante strains to see through the darkness. The wind is so strong now that he has to stand behind Virgil to break some of the air. The mist ahead of our poets clears. Virgil stands up tall and announces. You must now be brave, Dante, for this is Dece. This is Lucifer. This is the end of our downward path. Dante freezes and communicates with the readers directly. He says that he is not sure whether he is alive or dead. He is at this very moment staring upon the King of Hell himself. Dante tells the reader that Lucifer is absolutely enormous. Such as the difference between he and the giants, Lucifer would be the same size to them. Dante ponders how Lucifer could once have been one of the most beautiful of the angels. He appears grotesque and monstrous, with three disgusting heads. Beneath the heads are a pair of bat-like wings, and Dante discerns the source of the great icy wind. The heads are different colours. One red, one black, and one yellow. One head faces forwards, and the other two faces over Lucifer's shoulders. From each of his three faces, Lucifer weeps, with his tears dripping into each one of his mouths. Each mouth chews on the bloody pulp of a treacherous historical figure. In Lucifer's central mouth is a man flayed of skin, screaming in agony. Virgil states that this man is Judas Iscariot, he that betrayed Jesus and whose name christens this ring. The man in the black mouth is Brutus, who betrayed Julius Caesar. Brutus writhes in pain, but does not cry out. The last sinner is Cassius, who also betrayed Caesar. Virgil decides that it is time for them to leave, and that leaving hell will be difficult for both of them. Dante is pulled onto Virgil's back, and Virgil makes a death-defying leap to the back of Lucifer. 
he starts to climb down Lucifer into the ice. Dante goes wild because he thinks Virgil has finally lost his mind and is taking them further downwards still. Virgil reassures him, telling him that they are attempting to leave hell. As they lower themselves, Virgil uses Lucifer's tufts of hair to climb, narrowly avoiding the King of Hell's gigantic flapping wings. They pass through a hole in the ice below them and continue climbing down. Virgil reaches Lucifer's waist in the ice and cautiously rotates himself so that he is facing downwards. He starts to climb up. The poets have passed the midpoint of the earth and the world has inverted. Virgil says, Understand this, Dante. When Lucifer crashed into the earth and landed in his prison, he smashed into the southern hemisphere, where we have now entered. The lands of the south retreated from him to the north, leaving a single island behind. The poets reach a ledge, and Dante takes a deep breath, looking down on Lucifer's feet along the climb that they just made. Before them is a crevice, leading to a long and winding path alongside a stream. The path rises upwards and upwards to an exit and fresh air. Dante is finally on the surface of the earth once more. He looks up and he sees stars overhead. Having passed through the Great Inferno, he is now on the opposite side of the world. Welcome to the Island of Purgatory. <laughs>